All right, good morning, everyone. Oh, Melanie, if you can help me. So it's not popping up here. Oh, there we go. Okay, wait. I think, I think we got it. All right. All right, Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. And today we're talking about concussion and fatigue. And we're doing a little bit of a new twist on our streaming software. So thanks for hanging with us. Um, trying to get better clarity. This is the first video and the part of many videos um, in our series on concussion. Going to try and cover the main aspects as to why someone does not recover from a concussion and then what a person potentially can be thinking about and talking to their doctors about. Uh, lots of times it is a multifactorial reason why or there are multifactorial reasons why somebody is not coming out of it and we'll try to approach all of those. So we're starting out with concussion and fatigue because this is a really common symptom that concussion patients deal with. Also I'm going to try and bring you the most up-to-date literature on this matter. I seem to cycle through videos or topics like about every six months which is good because then we get to see is anything new out that you should know about or Maybe you know something I don't and let me know. Um, so yeah, so concussion and fatigue. So I guess one of the main questions is why do some people have a head injury and they're seemingly fine within a week to four weeks, whereas other people have a head injury and they're never the same or they're not the same for a long period of time. And that's really the key question. Seems to boil down to a variety of factors. What areas of the brain are damaged and remain damaged? Also, is there persistent inflammation still going on? Are hormones disturbed? Are you caught up in a chronic state of fight flight? Did the memory area become degenerated and that's causing the fear center to be in a, a constant state of fight or flight? Those are some of the possibilities. And fortunately, the testing has become so much better in the last five years. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of you are getting concussion diagnosis that's antiquated, which I don't even really like to make that statement, but I just did because this newest imaging is not everywhere in the world. It's not everywhere in the country. Some areas have it, some areas don't. Some doctors are aware of it, some doctors aren't. Um, and some doctors are aware of the inflammatory component, others are not. So I'll be going through all of those features uh, in coming videos, but as it pertains to fatigue, this issue that I have up on the screen right now, orthostatic intolerance, is one of the most important that I have found. Um, you're not going to find the most research articles on it, but in clinical practice, I've seen this to be a huge issue for post-concussion patients. So it's probably something you want to pay attention to. <clears throat> what is orthostatic intolerance? Basically, it means when a person stands up, does their blood pressure react the way it's supposed to? When we stand up, we want blood pressure basically to kind of go up a little bit or at least to stay normalized. And we want pulse to go up if we need it to, to get the heart beating harder and faster so we get more blood to the brain. What has been found here, this came out in 2016. Other uh, research groups have validated it where they took 24, or excuse me, they took 34 individuals with post-concussion syndrome. And they found that 24 of them, which was about 70%, had abnormal blood pressure testing when they did test for orthostasis. It's called the head up tilt table test. So they found that 24 out of the 34 were not regulating their blood pressure. Now, this, these are post-concussion syndrome patients not regulating blood pressure. And for some, they would think, well, that's a, a distant association. Is there something wrong with their heart? No. There's something wrong with their brain. And then because of that, then something can become wrong with the heart through time. Uh, in essence, about half of them, their blood was just staying down in their lower extremities and their blood pressure was low. The other half of those who had this abnormality, their blood pressure was down in their legs, or excuse me, their blood volume was down in their legs, their blood pressure was low, but then their pulse was going really high, fitting something called POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. So... Um, this is really, really an important finding because things can be done for POTS patients. You can do certain types of cardiac rehab. You can do fluid, fluid loading, so to speak, uh, salt loading. I'm not telling you to do any of that. I'm just saying there are treatments for this. 
And they showed that once the orthostatic intolerance went away, the post-concussion symptoms went away. So that's something of a lot of importance that I think all of you should know about if you're suffering with fatigue, particularly if you have fatigue and dizziness or if you have fatigue and headaches. Certainly headaches can be the post-traumatic headaches uh, talked about with concussions, but they can also be part of POTS. Um, I just put this article in there because it, it goes against um, some of the more common statistics where they'll say, you know, 85% of people who have a concussion will be fine, 15% will not be, some estimates I think I've seen around 7 to 5% of people will develop post-concussion syndrome. In this article, out of PLEOS 1, they said, in contrast to prevailing, excuse me, let me see here. It always puts this little slide up there. Let me go like that. Okay. In contrast to prevailing view, the most symptoms, that most symptoms of concussion are resolved within three months post-injury, approximately half of individuals with a single, that means just one, mild traumatic brain injury demonstrate long-term cognitive impairment which is really, really interesting. So they're saying half of people with one concussion have long-term cognitive impairment. So that's really, really important as well, because a lot of you just kind of have these nebulous complaints of, you know, I just don't think as well as I used to, or, you know, I'm just not as sharp, or, you know, I'm having trouble with directions, things like that. So know that you're not alone. And then we have the mitochondria. So... Your brain is 2% of your body weight. It consumes 20% of the oxygen coming into your body. So 2% of your body weight, but it consumes 20% of the oxygen. Your brain and your neurons are highly metabolically active. They use a lot of energy or yeah, and they need to produce a lot of energy to do that. And the mitochondria, which are colloquially referred to as the powerhouse of the cell, your mitochondria are what make energy. They make this thing called ATP. And so mitochondria tend to become damaged in concussions. So that's also important. So from the head injury, if your neurons, the mitochondria are not working as well, then you're more likely to have an issue with making energy in your brain. And here I highlighted previous studies have reported that traumatic brain injury reduces mitochondrial respiration enhances production of reactive oxygenated species, that's ROS, and triggers apoptotic cell death, suggesting, which is apoptosis, apoptotic cell death, suggesting a prominent role of mitochondria and TBI pathophysiology. So mitochondrial stabilization, stabilization is something that we do within our functional neurology paradigm here at Gates Brain Health, where we do approach patients nutritionally. We approach them from their microbiome perspective. That's their gut bacteria because you have more bacteria in your gut than you have cells in your body. And they've shown after brain injuries that the gut immediately starts to become more like a sieve and open up and pieces of bacteria or food molecules can start to leak in, creating inflammation. I'll do a video on that. And then all that inflammation can go to the brain and be a bad thing. And if your mitochondria and your brain are already compromised and now there's more inflammation, they're going to have trouble making energy. So then you're going to try and go to work and think. And then all of a sudden it's like you have, your brain crashes or you don't have the energy you used to. Your mitochondria may need to be stabilized. So what I, where I was going is that within our functional neurology paradigm, we do try to stabilize nutritionally or supplement-wise the mitochondria. We also then do brain rehab where we're doing specific eye movement exercises or other sensory motor exercises, trying to activate the part of the brain that was damaged. So, uh, okay, and that is the talk. So if you're fatigued, think mitochondrial stabilization, think do I have POTS or orthostatic hypotension, and those are the main factors that I've found to affect fatigue in TBI patients. Now, you might also have depression because, as I mentioned earlier, your memory area may be atrophying from the head injury or head injuries, which allows the fear center to take over and puts a person into fight flight. That could be a source of fatigue as well. But these were some of the clinical pearls that I've seen in clinical practice that are important. So let us know what you think. I'll be back probably tomorrow with another TBI talk. And 
I hope you all have a wonderful 3rd of July and have a great day, everyone. Let me see here. I'm going to end live video.